slide was the worst. I hope you can see it um, in around just before 1700 was a, a quite comprehensive description of light as waves. And then I'll show you the experiment. Thomas Young did a famous double slit experiment, which you might be might have heard of in around uh, 1800. That uh, I'm going to show or discuss that today a little bit. So that showed the diffraction of light. If you pa if you pass through two slits which are close to each other, of the order of the wavelength, the slit width is of the order of the wavelength. You see these diffraction pattern on some material which is photosensitive, so a photographic plate. So uh, it, this can this could be explained by Huygens' wave principle, right? So that light travels as wave as expanding wave and it can interfere and create those diffraction patterns so if you then go maybe i can just um, uh, i'll go through some of these developments but but fast forward to 1900s and around 1925 um, this Her uh, heisenberg and schrodinger were the two main people who came up with this who established formulated uh, uh, technically how uh, the rules of quantum mechanics and since then quantum mechanics has been used to describe motion especially of charged particles or small particles any small particle not necessarily charged in mi microscopic scale and and what i have found or written is that predictions of quantum mechanics have been verified experimentally to a very high degree of accuracy Obviously, if you go further deep and trying to establish other theories like in condensed matter or string theory, and that's a different matter. But so far, as long as you can do some experiments and observe some particles, do some measurements, they don't any violate any rules of quantum mechanics so far. Um, macroscopic properties of objects rely on those microscopic properties which rely on quantum mechanics. So it's not as if that I'm moving or a ball is rolling on the floor or some solid is conducting electricity. All those macroscopic properties, they, they have an underlying microscopic quantum mechanical description. Otherwise, if there was no quantum mechanics description or at the atomic level, the things would collapse and it would be not so sustainable. So the, the our solids, how liquids behave, how solids behave, all that understanding at the microscopic level goes with quantum mechanics. So basically, um, that's what I've written a few sentences here. And let's go through some of these experiments. So I, um, this is kind of a snapshot. Um, maybe I'll, I'll uh, some of the information I provided, I'll cover this later. So this is the famous double slit experiment that you ha may have heard of you shine light for example people did not have coherent light which is just single frequency plane wave but sunlight could be approximated up to there is certain coherence length involved if you mix a lot of frequencies together but within that uh, coherence length if you if you do the experiment well you can still observe diffraction pattern so um, this first slit is kind of to make this kind of like a not a randomly light which is not going in random direction to so basically convert it to a spherical wave so more approximate more like a plane wave more like a coherent light source and then the second the two double slits the each slit the the waves are kind of you can think of a re, reproduce or as spherical waves and when spherical waves in expand we all know through electromagnetic rules their phase terms they, they undergo superposition when they undergo superposition the phase it can constructively or destructively interfere to have no light or light so they observe these uh, diffraction patterns or bars high and with high intensity and low intensity so dark fringes and bright fringes on a detector or a photographic plate so interestingly this was in 1800 and then people started observing these uh, these lines in hydrogen spectrum so they would excite hydrogen maybe through some electrical spark or something and you can see even before 1900 people started to observe that hydrogen and excited hydro i mean all atoms did that but hydrogen was the simplest to understand people knew it was the lightest atom and still had very specific 
when you excite it and then you have some photosensitive plate which is sensitive to these different colors people started to have sensitive plates to uv light or visible or infrared and they observed these sharp lines and nobody was able to understand and describe what's happening um so the the progression of this was well people believe light was waste but in 1901 planck and you may be aware of this i i don't think i go into detail in in this course but this is a very interesting derivation if you have have you seen any anybody that black body radiation formula how it's derived have you seen that too in which course uh, i think we briefly went over it in what? Okay, good. So basically the way to derive this, there is no other way to explain it. People just phenomenologically thought, well, at longer wavelength intensity drops for any object which is hot. Black body means pretty much any object that absorbs all radiation. It does not reflect. So when you absorb some radiation, invariably you are absorbing that energy and becoming hotter. And any object which is hot, just heat is, it radiates into the atmosphere and that's called black body. So black body means it, it's completely radiating light because of the virtue of being hot, not reflecting light. And it had this strange spectrum. It, with the temperature, it peaks its peak where it emits changes, but it increases first and decreases with wavelength. And this could not be explained by any theory except when Planck came about and said, well, energy of electro, uh, light has to flow in bunches of H nu. Okay, so uh, I, 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 so energy, so I will say energy quantized in units of H nu. Nu is the frequency. Nu is in hertz is frequency. So when I say energy, electromagnetic energy is quantized in units. When he did that and applied some statistics, he was able to describe this. So people know well, what aspect of this energy is, is quantized. So that nobody knew that, but just, just kind of throwing it in there in, in a mathematical exercise. Soon after, in around 1905, Einstein did the photoelectric effect that described even more or basically confirmed this assumption of Planck even further that yes, you, it, its energy is in H nu. does not matter if you can shine the whole kilowatt of radiation on an atom. If your frequency is not right, you can never inject electrons out of it. So there has to be some energy H nu, which when falls on the electron, if it's enough, to eject it, otherwise it will just melt or something else will, but the electron is not going to come out. So then people started to think or understand that at, in electrons have some sort of a distinct energies. That's why it can interact. And then uh, later on, Bohr came up with his postulates, right? Uh, that electrons have certain energies in an at atom and it's rotating and that energy is its centripetal force is, is balanced by the Coulombic force. I mean, there is a lot of problems in that Bohr's model that I, I kind of wrote down. First of all, any charge which is accelerating must radiate according to Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations have not been found wrong either in the realm of what we study. So people knew Maxwell's equations, are right? The charges are accelerating according to Bohr, but why are they not radiating energy? And if they radiate energy, they should fall into lower energy levels. So Bohr said they are fixed energy states. So that part is not explained. Also, another part is that he said only the radi certain levels where the radius is such that the circumference is uh, integer multiple, the angular momentum is integer multiple NH bar, right? Uh, some some postulate, the third postulate. But where does that come from? That was also an assumption. Later on, D. Broglie, so we'll come to that here, right here. Later on, uh, through those postulates, you can actually very accurately, at least in terms of energy levels, find these energies, okay? Once you know the charges and of that. So that all these series were explained very well with Bohr. When you have such a good match with some experiments, 
at least some part of your theory must be right or something must be right about it. So you cannot just throw away Bohr's model. You have to just plug it in. And then De Broglie, I think around 1914 or 1925 or something like that, just before it suddenly started to come together, he came, well, each particle must also behave with like a wave. And the wavelength of the particle is H over P, the momentum. Okay, so the wavelength of the particle, so is here, I have written it down here, is must be some h over p. p is the momentum of the particle, which is m times the velocity. What is this wavelength does not specify. So that's one critical. When I was in high school, I was trying to dig into this and I got very confused. And if the teacher had said, well, I don't know the wavelength is, actually De Broglie did not know either. Then it would have been much more easier to go digest it. But it's kind of maybe written in the book somewhere, but it should be specified at the outset. He did not know what this wavelength is. It's some aspect of that particle is, is wave-like, and, wave, and that aspect, wavelength, is H over P. And it turns out, actually, it's interesting, although it's not very, you know, phys if you think that the circumference of the nth Bohr orbit, 2 pi r, is n times this wavelength. So it somehow kind of fits in. And, and obviously, it's kind of related to the wavelength of a probability density function. But it's not quite, it just fits in kind of like classically, but still does not much, you cannot see much more than this in there. It's, it's just, uh, it, it just kind of shows that this wavelength is somehow related to this particle. And each circumference is integer multiple of this wavelength. But what is this wavelength? They, they, they did not know. So um, I guess coming from all that, we had Bohr's postulate, which found the energy levels. We don't know why those energy levels are discrete. There is some understanding now that waves behave like particles, light electromagnetic waves. And particles behave like waves. So there is this dual, duality going on. And then, uh, obviously, then 1925, Schrodinger's equation was formulated. So before that, I'd like to show you this. I'll maybe send you these papers. So this was a kind. This is a kind of a cartoon picture of a double slit experiment done with electrons. So this was done much later in 1961. This was, you know, there was some poll and about some of the most beautiful scientists were asked what are the most beautiful experiments in the past century. And this was one of them. Uh, this is a double slit experiment with electrons and they were able to make two slits in a metal film. And there is an electron gun with high voltage, which is releasing electrons, bunches of electron charges. And then there is a photographic plate and they were able to see this diffraction pattern. So this was done by Klaus Johnson. And it's always interesting to read the paper. That's the paper right here. And uh, actually, let me open that paper. I'll send it to you later in 1961. So this is the paper by Klaus Johnson. And it's always interesting. Why did it take them so long? Actually, if you think about and look at the experiment, it took them probably this long to, to do it because, because of the difficulty in doing this experiment. To be able to observe the diffraction pattern, you have to have the slits and the spacing kind of of the order of wavelength. Actually, in this experiment, they are still much longer than the wavelength. But it's a fabrication issue. Obviously, you need to be smart and do the plan the experiment very accurately and everything. But here was a this somehow you can read the paper how they created it. It's very difficult. Even today, making their slits were 0.3 micron wide, which is very difficult. Even we cannot do in the clean room. We fabricate our devices in the clean room and we make features. We actually make some slits for some some of our lasers. They are about six, seven micron micrometer wide. And that's what you can do with normal lithography. 
Then you have to go to E-beam lithography to go under a micron. Now it can do. You actually use electron guns to do that. But they did it somehow made slits, which are you can read how they did it, 0.3 micron wide and, and less than a, or about a micron spaced apart and deposit silver film on a glass plate and made those slits on that film. And it was a quite a nice experiment if you see the, and they also show the, you know, they measured for different slits and this, these are the slits. These are not the diffraction patterns. And then they shine light through it. And you see the beautiful diffraction pattern. If you, if you had just one slit, there is no pattern, but you have multiple slits. And then this, so this is the paper that was in 1961, but there was an electron gun, multiple electrons are going. Feynman had this thought experiment, what if we just send one electron at a time at the two slits? Will we still see, and we should still see a diffraction pattern? And indeed, that one was done very recently in 2013. It's actually a double slit experiment done uh, with a electron source, which very controlled source, so you can actually send electron one by one. And they were able to, and you can also block slits as you go along. And with the same experiment, they were able to, if you block it, you get this kind of an intensity profile. You block this one, you get this profile. If you don't block any of them, you get this diffraction pattern, even with very one electron going at a time. In the previous experiment, you could argue that two electrons are going together and somehow they are affecting each other's path. In this case, how can an electron go either through one slit or two slit and interfere with each other? So, I mean, people still cannot answer this very well. Why is this? Uh, what's going on? And, and everybody knows that you cannot talk about electrons as particles. At that scale, they are they have to describe with a probability density function. So there is a probability that electron is here. There's some probability density. Electron is either here, but how does it self-interfere? Well, if you if you calculate probability densities, it will the answer will come out mathematically here. But what's going on physically? I don't know a good way to explain. In my view, the way to think about this is that electrons are not like the classical particles that you know, or for that matter, any small particles. They are kind of like these energy clouds or something like that, which get affected by any measurement that you do, or they don't have a, uh, basically they don't, their, their property or their nature is defined once they interact with something. Otherwise, they are this kind of bundles of energy. You could think like that maybe. That's how you can, that's my visualization, but everywhere you'll read it. There is no clear answer. My That's my way of thinking it. Once there is an energy, some sort of a, pro, which you can call probability density cloud, and then it can see both the slits. Then it basically, what hits the photographic plate is determined by how that cloud travels through this whole system. So there is definitely then interference going to be involved if this is spread out in the space and not localized. So you cannot think of any particles as localized anymore. So that's that's the way we can think about. Very nice paper anyway. So uh, so let's coming back to quantum mechanics. I'll just kind of write some basic uh, formulation of uh, what, what do we mean by wave functions and so forth. So before that, I would like to show. Uh, this this slide again, okay. Uh, this is an electromagnetic spectrum going from very small frequencies to high frequencies, okay. Long wavelength to short wavelength, right? So one gigahertz is 10 to the nine hertz is 30 centimeter wavelength, right? 30 centimeters is, is one foot, so pretty long. And you go to below one gigahertz, 100 megahertz, you're going to the length of football field and so forth. So at these very long wavelengths, um, we don't see, immediately see quantum mechanics at play, although it is still at play. We can still kind of treat electrons 
going through our, our devices in, in the manner as particles. We think of them as negative charge uh, particles traveling in the wires. How they are traveling, why they exist in the metal wire in the first place, its basis is in quantum mechanics. You cannot describe it classically. But once somebody kind of tells you, hey, there are electrons flowing in that wire somehow, and then you can actually describe everything with Maxwell's equations. As long as you define your current as how many electrons are going per second, and then you put a Maxwell equation, put an antenna, which is completely classical structure. You see how much current is oscillating in that antenna, and you can know the radiation from radiation formula, antenna theory, how much radiation is going. That's it. You, some energy is going to be emitted, and that energy needs to be fed by the circuit. So everything can be done classically. So we can uh, go through our undergrad, even you can do MS and PhD, if you don't really need to, you don't need really need to learn the why, or how, what's happening actually in a transistor at the, at the very microscopic level. But it turns out actually now people are, so now I think all electrical engineers should know more because now we are going into this regime where people are using light more and more. And when you are actually using light and not just using light for the sake of shining light and making bright and doing some simple experiment, but actually using light when it interacts with matter. Light-matter interaction is inherently quantum mechanical. There is no running away from it. We can learn, learn some aspects classically, but the, to really uh, do justice, you have to learn. For example, this very concept of an electron releasing its energy and falling in a lower energy state, higher energy to lower energy state. It's not actually physically going from here to there like in a wire. It's in the same place in an LED. You apply DC current to the LED, you're not even oscillating any charges. It's still releasing its energy in a photon. And that process is completely quantum mechanics. There is no charge, there's no Maxwell equation to describe that process. So this is a purely quantum mechanical process. Similarly, absorption of light. So anything where conduction band, valence band comes, it's all quantum mechanical. So we need to understand, understand that. So if we try to understand that, let's look at postulates or some sort of description of in, in quantum mechanics. So um, um, in quantum mechanics, we describe a particle, at, at least the what, what we are going to do is describe a particle's motion, basically. That's what we are interested in. If you are interested in some other properties, then you may have to deal with other things like uh, mechanical properties or thermal properties and magnetic. Well, magnetic properties can be uh, found within this description. But if you are just interested in motion, so that's sometimes what we need to know to know uh, how current flows in a uh, in in an electrical uh, solid device like a semiconductor. So for that purpose. If you have to describe a particle, it's, so what do we need? We need two things. Mass of the particle and we use something called uh, its complex wave function. So this is a quantum mechanical description. So let's, let's do in one dimension. Okay. Let's, let's describe this in one dimension. You can easily change it to three dimensions later on as we will see the wave, fun uh, the wave functions of hydrogen atom. So these three, this is a complex function called the wave function. So by complex function means it's a complex number at any x and t. So it's a function of space and time. So at this position, it's a different complex number. At this position, it's a different complex number. At different time, it's a different complex number. So it's a complex function. And it's called the wave function of particle in, in 1D. So these two parameters completely describe the particles. So these, they represent
the particle's existence and behavior as far as motion is con concerned, motion, location, physical location, energy, etc. Okay, so what does this complex wave function mean? As you all know, this is by itself, it cannot be measured. But it's related to a measurable. So first of all, this, uh, when I use a star, as you all know, this is the complex conjugate. So um, this may be very trivial. For example, if I have a, uh, if we do five plus four i, and I take its complex conjugate, that will be five minus four i. So the imaginary part is negative, right? So that's what com complex conjugate means. So that's the complex conjugate of a function. And if you have a, uh, if you have a complex number and you multiply by its complex conjugate, what do you get? magnitude square, right? So if you have A complex conjugate times A, you get magnitude square. So A, if A is a complex number. So similarly, this wave function, this cannot be measured. But what cannot, can be measured or is related to measurable quantity is the wave function squared, magnitude squared. So this is, this represents the probability density. So you multiply the complex conjugate function with the original function, that's called the probability density. So that's the probability density function for the for the particle. What does that mean? That means if you if you want to find find what's my chance if I measure well there are two things to th two ways to think about. If you have a million particles with the similar probability density, and you make measurements on those, how many particles and you make a lot of measurements. What's the probability? So I can write like this. What's the probability that I will find those particles from location A to B, within A to B? So that's, um, so this I can say probability of finding the particle at this between from A to uh, B in X axis. Maybe I should, Remove this A as a complex number, not to confuse you. Just a minute. Um, so I can say C star C equals to C magnitude square, and where C is a complex number. Yes. Pardon me? Yeah, so that will be, yes, good. So that's. To find the probability, this is not the probability density function. So you have to find the probability density for bit, between some locations. So you do integrate. So this probability density function is is per unit distance. Probability per unit distance. Okay. So the unit of this will be naturally one over meter in one d. So when you are finding the probability, you integrate from A to B and you do this probability density function and, and you do dx, right? So that's, so this is also, you can say per unit uh, distance, probability density per unit distance. Um, so everybody is okay with this. Um, you are aware of the Euler's, formula for complex functions, you know I is iota. So I, I want you both to be on the same, uh, same page. 
this probability obviously has to be less than or equal to one. And since the particle has to be found somewhere, we must have from minus infinity to infinity in this case, when we integrate this whole thing, we must have this as one. So this is called uh, normalization. Now, some books or somewhere, the answer may not be normalized. So you basically, um, it's, it's not a good idea. All the answers should be normalized. I mean, you can go far and without normalizing, your answers can be correct. But you have to be aware that I did not normalize. So all your equations, if you're using the wave function on the top, then you have to make sure there is something on the denominator too, and then they cancel out. Then you don't need normalization. But just to avoid any pitfalls, make sure the wave functions are normalized. So that's that. Um, so in classical mechanics, we have measurable quantities. And uh, so, so classical mechanics, so there is physical quantity. In quantum mechanics, we have the corresponding uh, operator. So there is a term called operator. So that's what we will cover next time. And I want you to read that uh, chapter. I will email you also. I think it's chapter four in, in the Miller's book, which probably you don't have. But the Chu's book, I think it's in chapter five or six. I, you can look it up. So quantum mechanical operators. For example, the position variable is x in classical mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, we can also call it x. Or we can call it x hat. Sometimes both, usually you use hat for operators, okay? So I would just use hat here. But the operator is, is same as, uh, is same as just x. Okay, you will know what I mean by that. Momentum, which is a vector in, in, in classical mechanics, its corresponding operator is a little tricky, is minus i h bar and the derivative x, del over del x. And then, so this x hat is also tricky. So that's why I probably I don't want to use this x hat. Mm, maybe I should not use. Let, let me not confuse you because I'm not talking about variables here. So let me just use x here. So um, I'll use that, show that in brackets. So here or OK, let me not confuse. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to write vector notation yet, OK? I'm assuming this is one dimension because I don't want, when you put the hat and then I have the uh, hats for the unity vectors, it's going, they're going to confuse. So just since we are dealing with one, one dimension, momentum is p is m times velocity. In quantum mechanics, is, where does this come from? So a lot of this is, remember, there is no derivation. Somebody came up with this formulation and and fitted it in is kind of like a phenomenological theory there's no nobody is deriving this from the ground principle up so some of this you kind of just take it for granted okay and then there is e that's the total energy now e has a lot of there is a potential energy kinetic energy so the total energy is the energy operator is i h bar del over d, del t so the time derivative corresponds to an energy operator and the spatial derivative is the momentum operator. So in general, you keep going down like this and you have some quantity Q 
and it's represented its corresponding op uh, operator we represent usually by q hat okay or sometimes people use q o p um this e operator is also sometimes e uh, uh, people use h operator for hamiltonian it's called also called hamiltonian operator for the energy <clears throat> so what is an operator this is the quantity in itself an operator operates onto some function of space and time so uh, by itself an operator does not yield anything but this operator can operate on some function of space and time so for example um, so operator must act or operate on some function of x and t so for example if there is some function uh, f of x so when you do p operator times f of x and usually when the op when you write something towards the right of the operator that's what you mean the operator operates on anything that hap is on its right not not on its left that's the convention we have followed so when you write p operator times fx that means this p operator is this uh, p operator is operating on this function of position x so what the, how do you find this out this is minus i h bar del fx by dx so the first deri partial derivative of fx also sometimes written as f prime x so um, one more thing that you have to remember that this is also uh, minus i h bar or sometimes this is also written as h bar over i right i is also same as minus one over i right because minus one is i square over i so that just something to know of sometimes you will see that h bar over i sometimes you will see minus i h bar similarly this thing will be i guess i don't need to write that uh, i i'm deleting so just just remember sometimes there is a minus and the sign difference here so this can be written as h bar over i and this time sometimes you'll find minus h bar over i uh, you'll find different so don't get confused in those two terminologies so so maybe i can write here minus i h bar is equal to h bar over i okay so any questions on this um the units of as i said wave function what are the units of the wave function by the way what what are the units of this thing let's see if you can figure out there's still a potential pitfall uh, okay. so, uh... be careful look look at still yeah it, it it's a function of position and time but i want to know the units of this wave function this complex function so when i say units of velocity velocity can be function of space and time it can be function of electric field it can be function of temperature for that matter whatever its function of doesn't matter its unit is what it is so what's the unit of this don't don't get confused by what's inside square root of 1 over meters so you you said right so 1 over meter is fine but that's for the probability density just look at this integral this integral should give me an answer for a probability which is unitless right so here i should say 
this quantity is unitless. So this quantity is 1 over meter. So this quantity is going to be 1 over meter square root in 1D. In 2D and 3D, there will be dx, dy. So it will be a different uh, unit. Okay, so another pitfall where somebody can make an error or usually one of those things which is again left, not written down. Okay, so what's the average value of an operator so when you when you that's called the expectation value or an average value so when i say q operator and i put two uh, uh, triangular or this yeah slanted brackets here i don't know what they are called are they called triangular brackets or just parentheses what well, just call them brackets <laughs> yeah, there must be a specific name to them. So this is called average or more, more technically right expectation value of an operator Q in state psi xt. So that's a kind of a weird um, description, but let me first write that down. What? How do you calculate that? You calculate that by using complex conjugate and then that operator and then the real, that uh, non-complex conjugate wave function and dx. So what are a few caveats here? Uh, first of all, it, it tells you that expectation value of energy what's if i measure this particle many many times with if it was in the same state state by state this means state of the particle right because the particle is described by this this state so this psi xt is also called state of the particle so when i say complex function or state complex state of the particle okay so that's one thing so what do you expect when you measure this energy of the particle either you prepare a million particles and measure the energy of each one of them you'll find this is the most or average value that you'll measure so this is associated with measurement So quantum mechanics is kind of related to statistics. Same thing as the double slit experiment. If you just really had only a couple of electrons go through the slits, you won't see this nice diffraction pattern. They will illuminate somewhere on the slits and maybe a couple of locations. You need to do measurement that diffraction pattern is then a statistical average. So, um, so that's just the expectation value. I, um, Make the here note here the Q operates on psi x of t and not on the left side, which is the complex conjugate. Okay, so that's something it always operates to the right. So, uh, operates on the quantity on right now not necessarily always so not always not all operate operators operate on right do you know any example So, uh, so you have to be careful when you take the adjoint of the operator, which we'll learn later, it operates on the left. And usually that's, that's when we start using the state vector representation, which we will come to next. So you don't have to, in general, 
for the way operator I have written, it operates on the quantity on the right. So let's kind of uh, derive Schrodinger equation. Okay. So uh, as as bad an example, so it's not derived, it's kind of a justification. So you, I would say not derivation, but So justification or of time dependent Schrodinger's equation. So this equation is used to calculate the wave function of a particle. So, because that was the question, right? We know it's mass, but what's the wave function of that particle? How do we know? Well, the simplest justification is kinetic energy. That's the kinetic energy plus potential energy equals to total energy. So um, kinetic energy, as we know, is half mv square, it's p square over 2m. So first I will write p square over 2m. Then I will write potential energy, some function of e, some u. And then I will write total energy E. So that's a classical equation. So uh, uh, Schrodinger's uh, or uh, quantum mechanical counterpart is you replace everything with an operator. So P square over 2M plus U equals to E hat. U hat. So this is a quantum mechanical equation with operators. And operators have to operate on some function. So you have to multiply them. Or uh, this must operate by themselves. They cannot be used for anything. So we operate this whole thing. We operate onto the wave function. That's how we define the wave function. You can say, why do you operate on the wave function? Why not with some other on some other function? Well. You can pick whatever function you want to operate on, but whichever function you operate on and describe the equation, that becomes the determining state function of your particle. So this is the state function of the particle. So then let's change p square to our, what was p square? Minus i h bar del over del x. So when you take square of minus, it becomes one. i square is minus one. h square is h bar square and uh, 2m so the left side is minus h bar square over 2m del square over del x square and that's the wave function here now u is an operator but it's a function of space and time so it's like a potential energy landscape in the so for example quantum wells in the quantum well, the potential energy is low. In the barriers, potential energy high. That's like in a semiconductor. Or, or uh, however you want to create this profile. So the operator of this function, so this is a function of x and t. And the operator of x and t is x and t itself. So think about this as a polynomial of x. And the operator of x is same as x. So you can get rid of the hat because it's a function of x and t. So that's the potential energy. Uh, remember the units of everything is joules here. Always remember everything is in joules. Wave function is in 1 over square root of per meter. And here I have the wave function. And here I change with the energy operator. I h bar del over del t uh, psi of 
or the wave function psi of x and t. So this is the um, Schrodinger time dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay, so you solve this equation. This is a differential equation, second order differential equation. So uh, solve this. Uh, so let me highlight that this is time dependent Schrodinger equation. So there is a time involved in this. So when you solve this, to get your description of the, this is also called the state function. So I'm just writing different name or wave function of the particle. So in this equation, what are the inputs that we, we put? What are the inputs? Inputs means what we know of. We know of the mass and we know of the potential energy profile. So this we can call the potential energy landscape. So this could be external forces, etc. So external, basically all the external forces can be combined in here because change in ux, you, you remember change in potential energy is equal to force, right? The rate of change in potential energy is how you apply force. So if there is a force that you apply by applying a voltage on a device, that's basically change, introducing a space-dependent potential energy profile. And you can ha also have a time-dependent force, a time-dependent. So all the external stimulus can, is, is, is going into this. So if it's changing with time, well, so be it. Your wave function will change with time. So those are the inputs and the boundary conditions too. Right, how big is that, where it ends, where the potential energy suddenly goes to zero and or the, in, or the initial conditions. That initially at time zero, this was particle was like this, the wave function was like this. And those are the all the inputs, and there is only one output is your wave function. So it's easier said than done. It's, it's very difficult to calculate. It's a function of space and time. And if we could do this for every particle, our answers, we can solve it. That turns out it's very difficult to do when there are two particles involved. If there were only two electrons flowing in a semiconductor, that would be very hard to do because they also have forces on each other, Coulombic force, and then force due to the atoms. And forget about many body, when there are gazillions of electrons in a semiconductor, it's a many body problem. What happens when you have impurities? What happens when you shine light? Every time you do something, your potential energy profile changes, your wave function changes. It's basically almost you can give up and not solve it, but uh, uh, but we have come up with smart ways to solve this, right? So an external stimulus example would be apply uh, voltage on a semiconductor. Um, shine light. Okay, and that, those are two of the electrons. Um, shine. 
by by light means well let's just say shine uh, electromagnetic radiation i that's those are the simplest examples that i could think of so any questions on this so typically we don't solve this um, typically we don't uh, solve for time varying uh, u which means or stimulus because it's very difficult to do so we assume ux is time independent okay that's that simplifies things quite a bit and then uh, we deal with how do we deal with time dependent phenomena anybody has an idea so time dependent phenomena if you apply an ac current or if you apply light radiation that's a time dependent because light is time dependent variation of an electric electromagnetic field uh, by using what anybody how do we deal with the time dependent phenomena when we are solving for uh, in in physics of devices what do we use do you kind of can you put things together in your mind from what you know how do we solve uh, quantum mechanics of electrons for anything that's time varying so so remember time independent is we can solve for the electron levels we can solve the conduction band, valence band. That's all time dependent. We don't think that anything is changing. But then we deal with all the phenomena. Why are we studying this? To understand how any semiconductor conducts light, uh, electricity. How does it conduct? How does it behave when you shine light on it? How can you, when you shine femtosecond light, what happens when you, you know, that professor came who gave a talk that day, when you shine this light and there, it, electrons are excited to some state and how are they falling with certain picosecond time scale that's time dependent phenomena how do we either you can do experiments which he was doing but you also need theoreticians who need to estimate that and understand that phenomena he used some terminology what was he you were not there on that what did he use he said well your friend from volkmar's group is working on it what, how is he, how is she modeling it she is using some rate equations have you heard of rate equations oh. well it's some sort of phenomena by you deal with the answers that you know time independent and the time dependent things are usually small variations to that you poke a little bit anything that light that shines it does not change the crystal potential by too much it does not change at all actually very minor so you deal by using perturbation theory so deal with all such uh, changes as perturbations okay you can go to as high an order you can so that's what we'll do a little bit of that in the coming week and understand what it means and we'll also do a couple uh, well problem i didn't give you homework yet you'll get your homework on thursday so you will actually solve some some of the very in matlab uh, wave functions so to get an idea of what this means um so so let's look at time independent uh, 
Schrodinger's equation. So where u x of t basically is is just u x. It's a the function of potential energy is a function of just space, not time. So does this mean since now u x uh, is not a function of time? Does this mean and and on the answer actually? Let me give you the answer. Is not is no. That this wave function is just a function of space. Uh, space and not time that's that the answer is no you could you could argue that maybe it is it should be everything should be function of space but actually in general and and it turns out in reality if you change this to just function of space who is to say that this has to be not function of time you can still have it function of time and still satisfy that equation so what you have here, you have minus h bar square over 2m, del square over del x square, psi x of t, plus ux psi x of t equals to i h bar del over del t. Okay. Uh, nothing suggests, not well, mathematically at least, that psi x t cannot be function of time. So, but it's but with a measurable quantity, which is the probability density function. So then you start from applying a practical. Uh, consideration the probability density is the measurable quantity is not the wave function but its probability density function this must be independent of time so and the, the, so again i am doing a bad job because i am not good i am not the mathematician here but you could argue from a completely mathematical point you could argue for this differential equation, the only way, the only possible um, nature of psi x t is equal to some function of x, which I'm going to use a small psi without the uh, without the bars on top this one so you can make sure what I have you see these bars I have the big psi Greek psi and this is a small psi and then it's got it can be by separation of there is a separate multiplied by a function of time and the this function of time must have a magnitude of one so th those are the two things that we need mathematically And you substitute this back, and I'm going to skip some of the steps. Substitute in time dependent Schrodinger's. equation and I'm, I'm saying and you can derive so not you I'm not deriving this there are a few steps and you can derive the following minus h bar square over 2m del square over del x square psi x So I am skipping some steps here, plus ux psi x equal to e times psi x.
Okay, so what is this E? So I so this can be a little bit uh, confusing here. Um, e, I am using E as a because this is a commonly used. This is not the total energy that I mentioned the last time, but this is still used as E because it is somehow specifying energy. E is a parameter. Let's let's write right now. E is a parameter such that pi of t is e to the minus i e t over h bar. So uh, first things first, psi of t, its magnitude, this is a complex number, but this magnitude has to be 1. If its magnitude has to be 1, that means the 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 only way it can happen is maybe it's some exponent of some function of time. And then when you substitute this kind of a function here, and that should give you uh, basically a constant because the overall function that you are left with, the site of t comes out. Basically, this function, when it operates on that phi of t, should be a time independent value. So when you, this is the only type of function that can fit in. So this is kind of a hand waving argument. The only way this differential equation can work for a time independent ux when, when phi of t is of this form. Yes. Yeah, so when you take its derivative with respect to t, then you get minus i e over h bar, and that cancels with i h bar, and then you get e. So, so this is, you can kind of think of like this. Yeah, I mean, you're instead of this phi of t, you're using this parameter e. We don't know what this parameter e is, how to solve. So now this is, obviously this is called time independent Schrodinger equation. But there is something different here in this equation. And what's that difference? The difference is that there are inputs, again, R mass m and u of x and outputs are psi x of t obviously that's the output or you can think of this as two outputs the small psi of x and the e parameter e which gives the phi of t. So we almost always never think about phi of t. Have you anybody? You only think of e because that's how we learn. We learn that these are the e. That's what you did in your homework. You found an expression for e and there are different answers possible. So how many variables there are in this equation? Two variables. So this is one equation in two variables, kind of. And this is not, a again, a cheating kind of an argument, which is psi of x and e. So obviously, you can have many solutions to this. Right? e is also a parameter that you can adjust. So if this was just one variable, there will be one solution. But there are, so there are, infinite solutions possible. So we label them by an index, n usually. So that's why I will put an index n, 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 n. So, 
psi x of n and e n are a solution pair and that pair is called the eigenfunction and eigenenergy. Okay, so maybe in the last couple of minutes, I just want to exp kind of give you an, an uh, anybody has an analogy, have heard of any equation which is similar in this to Schrodinger equation from your uh, physics, any other equation that you may have heard of in physics or electrical engineering, both of you. Yeah, this time independent uh, Schrodinger equation. Any other differential equation that you could think of? Uh, heat, equation. heat equation. Is that is that similar to the this second order differential equation? So this is a second order differential equation and it's an eigenvalue equation. So is that heat equation also an eigenvalue equation? Okay, so the, the one that I know that I use often in electromagnetics, the guided wave equation. And we kind of, we didn't really solve this equation, we found the solution. So you saw that probably in 203, that's the, it's called the Helmholtz equation uh, also. So for example, this is a one dimensional waveguide and you're trying to find electric field and you have that waveguide has, or an optical fiber. So NX is the, uh, in the X dimension, X is the cross-sectional of the, uh, of the waveguide. So, uh, X is the cross-section and this wave is propagating in Y or Z direction. And so this is the guided wave equation. Uh, for example, this could be uh, an optical fiber. This could be the X dimension. So the N, N is the index that changes in the X dimension, refractive index and the wave propagates in y or z em guided wave propagation and so ex is analogous to is analogous to the wave function it's the cross section of the e field what kind of a field propagates in a fiber nx is the refractive index of profile in the center, the refractive index is high. As you go to higher x, refractive index goes to low. So what will be nx analogous to in this equation? Potential energy. And your solution is ex, but nx is analogous to potential energy. And beta is the propagation constant. Have you taken any course in which, well, I guess we did beta in two or three. You may somewhat recall. So that's, that is related to the energy that you sign. So that's the eigen energy. There are uh, other examples too, okay? So um, I'll just skip that and two more minutes. I'm taking an extra, some extra time. So here is uh, in your notes, you can, some of these notes I have written down, I will won't go over these. Uh, in the last, in this second page, I see that you did problem right, except there was some error in one of, in your submission. Um, one of your submissions is, so this is a particle in a box problem. In the homework, this box was defined not from 0 to L. So X is 0 to L, right? It's what I, that's the only trick I added to the problem. I made it from L to 2L. 
that's one trick and second trick that I, I, I added was this is normally how you specify particle in a box your potential energy is zero everywhere and infinity at the two ends so there is a zero there u minus e right schrodinger equation time independent is this one i could also rewrite it as minus h bar square over 2m del x del square del x square this plus u minus e psi f x right so u can be zero in the particle in a box problem but there in that homework problem i had u as some constant v1 so when your answers come out this is a standard answer but your energy will be this plus v1 when you solve the equation and when you find the wave function it will be shifted from l to 2l so this will turn out to be x minus l yeah that's the only so look at the solution so that the other than that there was nothing else i wanted to point out in your homework so this is uh, again i have uh, on your screen is time dependent so this is little more generic actually it's easier to understand this is plus i h bar right you see and then this this derives this time independent u x minus e derives from this obviously this one is easier to solve and this is the one we solve and to be honest i have never really solved this for any problem you only look at the solution you deal with this and any time dependent thing comes in you you deal it as a perturbation so i guess we can uh, what yeah we can just finish off i just want to show you some revise some of the uh, you can read through this I, I i won't spend too much time or the wave function in a hydrogen atom so read through this how they look like is kind of your um, chemistry from first year or high school and and you know how the electrons fit in the shells and little bit i want to give you a flavor of how bands are formed so this is silicon by itself and what is this curve thing this is u of x that x is r spherical so this is a potential energy of a silicon atom so the nucleus is here potential energy is q square over 4 pi epsilon r so it's a 1 over r relation r is a spherical coordinate and then you can solve the schrodinger equation and this answers that i showed you I, i'll go over this again next time okay these these answers are basically particle in a box solutions but for that spherical potential so we'll go this over this a little bit and then we'll start some of the terminology we'll use for operators in the next class